mode. And Nick, are you recording? Yep, I'm recording. Okay, great. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management. Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network for short. Uh, we're very pleased you could be with us here today. Um, this webinar is uh, co-hosted by um, the EBM Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by NatureServe and Open Channels. And we also um, are our co-host, I also have a co-host here from Open Channels, Nick Wehner. Uh, who is recording the webinar right now. Um, and I'd like, I'd like to thank everyone for being here and then um, welcome our speaker, Robert Weary from the Nature Conservancy, uh, specifically the NatureVest. Um, he's the Senior Director of NatureVest within the Nature Conservancy. Um, he's going to be speaking today about financing marine conservation and adaptation to climate change in the Seychelles uh, via a debt swap. Uh, we've had um, a few issues with his internet, so I'm going to be sharing his slides while he presents, um, and we're glad it's going to work out that way. Um, I did want to let everyone know um, how to ask questions. Um, well, there's two ways to ask questions during the webinar. You can type them in the question panel of your user interface, and then I will relay those questions to Rob. Um, since it's silent, you can do this at any point during the webinar. Um, and uh, quick clarifying questions I can uh, ask Rob during the presentation, but substantive questions will hold to the end. Uh, you can also raise your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in your user interface. You can raise that, and then I'll unmute you, and you can ask a question directly to Rob. Um, I would warn you, though, that this option only works if you have a working microphone or if you've called into the, um, the phone line if you've entered the PIN number. So anyway, um, thanks, Rob. We're so glad you could be with us today. So, sorry about the early hijinks. Yeah, no, my pleasure, and uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, just a little further introduction. I've uh, had the pleasure of uh, working for the Nature Conservancy now for um, 18 years, and have worked in the Caribbean and with small island states my my whole career, and have focused on conservation finance mechanisms uh, such as uh, this this debt swap. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with NatureVest, we're a new team uh, in um, the Nature Conservancy created about three years ago. Uh, basically, you can think of us as the investment banking arm of the Nature Conservancy. Um, we have, uh, having been around for 65 years, the Nature Conservancy has, uh, and, and having um, bought and, and had a lot of land donated to us, we have a fairly large balance sheet and uh, a double A bond rating. And so, our, our organization has decided that uh, you know to further our mission rather than just relying on grants, how can we put together projects that use impact capital, basically loan capital, uh, but the impact meaning that there's some impact on the ground, in this case, you know environmental impact. Um, so moving on to uh, the, the next slide. Um, um, we, yeah. so why the, so why the Seychelles? Um, it's a huge exclusive economic zone. Um, I have a map a little bit later. I'll show that to you. Uh, 1.4 million square kilometers. Um, Seychelles sits off the, the coast of Africa uh, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It's a top regional marine mammal site, key global seabird, uh, seabird breeding ground, lots of coral. Uh, fisheries and tourism are over 60% of uh, GDP. And, and the Seychelles as a, as a country and a government has been a global leader in promoting uh, small island developing states issues, the blue economy, and they have been leading uh, the drive to put together a West Indian Ocean Challenge. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what are we trying to, to address? Um, obviously, there's the, the issue of um, lack of, uh, of funding for marine protected areas, lack of marine protected areas, and, and the threats to the marine realm. Uh, but as well, on the economic side, uh, a lot of these SIDs have really unsustainable debt loads, a lot of it attributable to natural disaster recovery costs. Um, a good example is um, in, in, in the Caribbean in Grenada in 2004 when Hurricane Ivan blew through, uh, damage was somewhere around 200 percent of GDP. Uh, you know, obviously, a country to recover from that has to borrow money, and then you throw in a global fiscal, uh, the, the, um, the financial crisis in 2007 and eight. And if you rely on tourists and the tourists don't come, that's a, a, an additional uh, uh, impact on the economy. And not surprisingly, for example, Grenada recently uh, has spent the last three years uh, restructuring uh, their debt. Seychelles as well uh, was hurt by the uh, 2008 financial crisis in that uh, their bank was uh, Lehman Brothers. And for those of you who remember, Lehman Brothers was the one that 
started the whole uh, dominoes falling and went bankrupt. And of course, when that happened, the Seychelles as well as a country went bankrupt and had to do a lot of restructuring. Um, and of course, when you have low growth and high debt loads, it means there's limited fiscal space for investments in the environment and adaptation to climate change. And I think, as we all know, SIDS are highly vulnerable to external shocks, natural disasters, climate change, and of course, things like the global financial crisis. Next slide, please. There are some good opportunities out there. Um, the small United states definitely show a lot of leadership um, you know, beyond the issue of, uh, of a lot of adaptation and mitigation funding being made available through the climate negotiation. Um, I mentioned the West Indian Ocean Challenge. Uh, other island states like in the Caribbean and Micronesia have also organized themselves around these challenges. Um, and basically, these are uh, commitments to put 20 to 30 percent of their marine area under protection by 2020 along with a few others. And the Caribbean, for example, is also to develop sustainable finance mechanisms. Um, pr prior to my working on, on debt conversions, that was, uh, I spent uh, about six years working on putting, helping the country put the Caribbean challenge together and getting that launched back in 2008. And then back in, uh, I think it's approaching five years now, with the Rio Plus 20 meeting in uh, um, where the SIDS, the focus of that, uh, that meeting was, of course, the green economy, but the, the SIDS put forward the concept of the blue economy and said that for them to truly have a sustainable economy moving forward, uh, there were a few areas they needed to focus on, and, and including improving fisheries management, improving coral reef management, and adapting to climate change. There were, there were a few other things that they put forward, but these were the ones that uh, we wanted to help them address holistically um, via these, these debt conversions. And, and I should say you might hear me use interchangeably debt swap, debt conversion, um, debt restructuring more or less mean the same thing. And I'll explain what exactly that is here shortly. Next slide, please. Um, so what is a debt swap? Um, the, the first ones uh, were concluded and emerged out of the uh, debt crisis in Latin America in the late 80s, where the US government canceled almost $900 million of debt to seven countries in Latin America. And while the US wrote the debt off on their books, they, they did not uh, cancel the debt 100%. They, they told those countries, they probably wrote off a portion, maybe 20 or 30 percent, but said the remaining portion they needed to spend in country on development projects, be it health, education, or environment. Um, obviously, it's a pretty good deal for the country if you think about it. They borrowed some money, uh, spent it once, and then they get it forgiven by their uh, the U.S. government, the creditor, and then they're told to spend it a second time. So that was the, 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 the origin of these, these debt swaps. And that would be an example of a bilateral stop swap, meaning that it's a debt uh, owed between two sovereign countries. Uh, but uh, countries will also borrow uh, on the market from banks, et cetera. And so you can do commercial debt swaps. Of course, they're not going to just write it off 100%, but you can buy debt at a discount. Um, debt is traded around the world uh, every day, large amounts of debt. And there's a, a formula, net present value, for calculating the, the current value of a future cash flow. And so um, you just use that to price debt. And so it's quite possible sometimes to buy debt for, uh, you know, in distress situations for pennies on the dollar um, or, you know, some of the deals we're looking at, we're, we're looking at uh, paying 50 to uh, 80 cents on the dollar. And that's what really makes the, the debt work, uh, makes these deals work. And you can do the same with buybacks of bilateral debt too. And to be honest, the, the days of countries like the U.S. or um, the French uh, and the Germans were also big uh, proponents of these debt swaps. Them writing off 100% of the debt are pretty much over. So um, our experience in the Nature Conservancy, next slide. Um, from the late 80s, we did a number of commercial debt swaps, uh, totaling about $50 million. Most of these were in uh, Central America, um, in the Caribbean. Um, most of our experience came through a US mechanism called the Tropical Forest Conservation Act or TFCA. Uh, we did uh, 11 of the 17 that were done by the US government. Uh, I worked on the first one in 2001 that we did, which was in Belize. I uh, worked on another, another few uh, in, the, in the regions, Jamaica, uh, Costa Rica, and Guatemala. They allowed a third party like the Nature Conservancy to put in uh, about 20% of the capital necessary to buy the debt back, with the remaining capital coming from uh, the, the act itself. Uh, kind of interesting, Congress made available funding uh, to buy back U.S. debt. Um, so it was one, one part of U.S. government paying off another. 
Uh, but uh, the Treasury, who we, we worked with on these deals, still use net present value. And on average, we paid about 55 cents on the dollar to buy back that debt. And so from TNC side, we put about $14 million in, allowing us to purchase uh, with the additional funding um, from there are a few other uh, NGOs that worked with us, like WWF and CI, on a couple of the deals. Uh, and then the TFCA Act itself, putting the rest of the money in, and we bought about uh, $210 million of debt. That's the face value. Uh, the result was over almost a quarter billion dollars in principal and interest payments for forest conservation in those 11 countries. So from our standpoint, it was a pretty good uh, return on investment, if you think about it. Every dollar we put in created about $17 on the ground. Uh, not many projects out there give you that sort of leverage. So we became big fans of these. Unfortunately, this is not funded anymore uh, by the U.S. government, and uh, uh, so we needed to come up with a, a new model. Uh, next slide. So started working with the Seychelles um, years ago. It was actually at Rio uh, when uh, we did an event, Leaders Value in Nature. Uh, the vice president of Seychelles came and spoke. And, and said that if uh, they could pull off a debt swap, uh, they would put 30% of their EEZ, their exclusive economic zone, into protected areas. Um, I can't remember if I said next slide or not, but we should be on the slide that says Seychelles Commitments. Um, yes, that's where we are. OK, great, thanks. Um, and you can see, as I mentioned, the, the, the exclusive economic zone of the Seychelles and how it sits there off of, of Africa. Um, so. For uh, currently, only about 1% of the Seychelles waters are in marine protected areas. And uh, going to 30% would take them to uh, about 400,000 square kilometers. And they also agreed to make half of those areas, or the equivalent of 15% of their EEZ, uh, no-take fish replenishment zones, um, or high biodiversity areas, as, as the uh, stakeholders like to call them on the ground. Um, and we did all of this through a marine spatial planning process. Um, I think most folks are probably familiar with that. Um, it was about 18-month process, 12 workshops, 100-plus folks at every workshop. Of course, uh, representatives from the conservation sector, but also tourism. Um, Petro uh, Seychelles uh, was there. Uh, they're the oil exploration company. Um, you had uh, shipping, those major shipping lanes through there, and then, of course, the fisheries community from artisanal to semi-industrial to commercial. Uh, the Seychelles waters, of course, big uh, tuna fishing area. And to put this in context, you know, Seychelles, is, uh, as I mentioned, has been a leader around conservation. Uh, half of their terrestrial uh, land area is already in national parks. And so uh, you know, they saw this as a natural a next step. Um, and and as they have said, you know, we used to only think about our ocean about as far out as we could see, but we realized that, you know, less of our, than one percent of our EEZ is land, and over ninety-nine percent is ocean, and we really need to think about how we manage that in a holistic fashion. And that was the idea of the Marine Spatial Plan, not only to um, to zone uh, the various use areas, um, but to you know, it's a you know idea of how you mitigate um, you know competing interests and. Um, so that was uh, obviously a very important part of, of the uh, the deal, and um, and that is being finally finalized here in the next few months, and will be officially adopted as as um, policy by the government. And um, and uh, is the government has a, uh, timelines for implementing the, the various phases. Uh, once the MSP is adopted, about 15% uh, of the new uh, marine protected areas will be put in place, and the remaining 15% put in place between now and, and, and 2020. Uh, so they'll be phasing those in. Uh, next slide. So how does this deal work? Uh, this one you will we'll have to click through slowly. It's a, the best way to understand it. So click one more time, uh, and another time until you see the uh, Seychelles Conservation Climate Adaptation Trust. So that you'll see that everything flows in and out of this box. Um, it is. Uh, this was created through legislation. Um, it's a majority non-government board, so uh, the Nature Conservancy sits on the board, uh, as well as the uh, couple local conservation NGOs, the Hotel Tourism Association, and the uh, cha the business the Chamber of Bu Business and Industry. So that way, we bring private sector in, and then on the government side, they have four seats: Minister of Finance, Minister of Environment, Minister of Natural Resources, and the head of the Island Development Corporation, which is a, a state-owned entity that manages the offshore islands and uh, has a fleet of planes to get back and forth and um, 
uh, obviously pretty important when most of those, the, all the new marine protected areas are going to be around those, those various island chains you saw on the map. So um, the Seychelles, you also see in the top there is the debtor and uh, the Paris Club creditors. So what is the Paris Club? Paris Club is, uh, not surprisingly, hosted by uh, the government of France in Paris, by the Treasury. It's been around, I think it's approaching 60 years now. And it's a, um, a place where um, debtor countries, when they need to restructure debt, can go and meet with all their creditors in one place. Paris Club meets once a month, 10 months out of the year. And uh, so we negotiated the buyback of the debt uh, in the Paris Club. And the participants that we bought the debt back were France, the UK, Belgium, and Italy. Um, and so um, that, those are the, the four countries that we bought debt back from. So you click again uh, two more times, you'll see uh, TNC. We brought to the deal um, uh, in step one there, the green number one, uh, five million in grants that we raised from uh, various foundations, um, and then 15.2 million in a loan. Uh, which was from our own uh, capital. Um, we, we're looking to, to potentially replace that um, with a, a, a development finance institute. Uh, um, uh, but if um, if not, you know, TNC would be able, you know would hold that loan. Um, and then uh, you'll see, and uh, some of these are coming out of order. My apologies. If you click again, you'll see over number two. The funding went uh, from the 20.2, which is the loans and grants together, went to the Seychelles government. And then in step three, the Seychelles uh, sent that money to those four countries I mentioned and in return for the purchase of $21.6 million. So uh, the discount was only seven, about 7%, 7 93 cents on the dollar. Um, it took us, as I mentioned, uh, about four years to put this deal together. We closed it uh, February. This February 28th will be uh, a year ago. Um, and what happened you know, at, at the beginning, we were modeling a discount of around 20, 25 cents on the dollar, which was, was accurate at the time. But uh, over time, uh, the Seychelles was a model country on how to come out of a debt crisis, running budget surpluses, successfully floating their currency, reducing their debt to GDP ratio. And obviously, those are all really good things for a country to do, makes them a better uh, uh, creditor. Uh, or excuse me, a debtor and, and gives them a better credit rating. And what that means, though, is, is that you get less of a discount. So not being able to move fast did hurt us. Um, uh, the change in, in that discount rate, um, you know, did, we did lose a fair amount of money uh, for, for funding work on the ground. Um, the, then the next step in four, um, if you click, you'll see then um, the government then wrote two notes to this trust. Um, the first note of 15.2 million mirrors the note from the Nature Conservancy. It's a 10-year note at 3%. Uh, the second note of 6.4 million is the conservation note. Um, we might wonder where that number came from. If you add that with the 15.2, that equals the 21.6. So that's the, the total debt purchased. That second note is also 3% interest rate, but a 20-year note. Um, so we did uh, keep the interest rate the same as what they had with their Paris Club creditors at 3%. Um, there were some other financial benefits, which I'll explain later. And that's the, that note is the funds the work on the ground. So you uh, see, if you click again, the repayment from the trust uh, back to TNC, uh, the, the 17.7 million, so the principal and interest payments over 10 years. Click again in step six, you'll see the uh, funding on the ground. It's about 5.6 million over 20 years, or 280,000 a year in principal and interest payments. And one more click. Uh, we then take about 150,000 a year, or three million over the 20 years, and use that to capitalize an endowment. Uh, every year, those funds go in; they're invested. Uh, any returns are reinvested. The idea being that when that second note, uh, the 20-year note for conservation activities, finishes in year 21, we can tap into the endowment and keep funding this work moving forward. Um, this trust uh, is set up as a grant-making entity, not an implementing entity. So. It will do an annual call for proposals, and, and um, the board will make decisions on what the priorities are. And I'll speak to those in, in, in a second, um, what was funded out of these deals. Um, but the idea is if you create this um, trust in this way, it becomes a magnet for additional funding. And, and we're already seeing that, for example, uh, later this year, the, the government is um, issuing uh, their own blue bonds uh, to finance um, the blue economy and also 
to support the implementation of the Marine Spatial Plan um, via, uh, with three million of that 15 million coming to the trust over five years. So we've already attracted an additional three million and that being split between um, financing a new fisheries management plan for the Mahe Plateau, which is the main plateau where the main island sits of Mahe, and then half of it to support the marine protected areas. And the expectation is, is that we would you know, continue to uh, attract additional uh, funding to this trust. You know, obviously, 280000 a year is not a lot. Um, and just to give you an idea of how price movement, that discount changing, uh, how it affected the deal from the beginning, um, you know, moving from 75 cents on the dollar to 93 cents on the dollar, we lost over about 17 million dollars that would have been uh, on funding conservation work. So that was painful, but uh, you know, a lesson learned that you, you sometimes need to move faster, uh, move fast on these deals. But um, it was the first of its kind in many ways, in that it was the first uh, debt swap focused on marine conservation and climate adaptation, the first one ever negotiated in the Paris Club, and the first one um, ever using, uh, done, completed using impact capital. And so uh, obviously when you have a lot of firsts, it, you know, these things can take a little, uh, take time. And, and to be honest, what the holdup was uh, raising the grant money. Uh, so the next slide, so what do we fund out of this? So obviously if you, the, the government's expanding the marine protectory system, uh, a lot of the funding would go to that. It could fund coral mangrove restoration work, um, you know, the marine spatial planning uh, process identified where there's policy holes, so we could uh, uh, help um, update policies. Economic diversification, um, this is one where that additional uh, 12 million uh, from the blue bonds that the government is raising is actually going to be a revolving fund for economic diversification. Um, it's going to be managed by the Seychelles uh, Development Corporation, but um, the trust SACAT will play a role in, in, in picking projects. So uh, in many ways, we won't need to put any funding toward that given that uh, $12 million revolving fund, loan fund. Uh, and then finally, social resiliency to climate change. This is something we've been doing in the Caribbean where we get high resolution uh, satellite data, look at uh, um, which, what happens if there's one, two, three meters of uh, sea level rise to the coastlines. And given that so many people in these small islands live on the coast, uh, we can share this information with the coastal communities, make them aware of what the impacts of climate change might be, and, and help them think about how they need to um, uh, address, potentially address any of these impacts moving ahead. Uh, next slide. Um, so I mentioned some of the financial benefits. There were financial benefits to the government. So there's no debt uh, relief per se for the government. What you get is a redirection of external debt service. So $11 million over 20 years that would have gone to those um, Paris Club creditors, so back to France, Italy, UK, Belgium, and instead is invested in the country. And that portion of, of the funding that is spent on the ground in the country, the government can make those payments in local currency. So um, the, the, the note is denominated in dollars, but on the day they make the payment, the spot exchange rate, they can make two-thirds of the payment in local currency. Obviously a benefit to the country to not have to uh, use uh, hard currency like dollars and, and be able to use local currency, which makes sense. We're going to spend that money in the country. The remaining third of that uh, 11 million is the portion that is uh, funding the uh, endowment. Obviously, we want that in, in U.S. dollars. Um, and uh, there's improved fiscal space, uh, meaning that we part of the reason also that the, uh, the we only got a 7% uh, discount was that we targeted some of the shorter term debt with average maturity of eight years. Through the deal, we extend the maturity out to about an average of 13 years between the two notes, which uh, means uh, the government still pays the same amount out, but what they pay on an annual basis is less, and so that creates fiscal space for the government. And then finally, the, the government entities are eligible to apply for funding to SACAP, so it's not just civil society, but also government. So there's a lot of benefits to government for, for doing something, doing this deal. Um, some of the outcomes you know, mentioned again, uh, recapping, you know, with the, the loan and the grant, we get the expansion of the marine protected area system, updated policies, both of those based on a completed marine spatial plan, uh, funding for marine and climate adaptation work, and then of course, uh, and that that number there includes the three million from the um, the Jeff, uh, or excuse me, from the uh, the blue bond issuance by the government, which is being supported by the Jeff and the World Bank, I should mention. And, uh, and then capitalizing that endowment. Um, working on a number of, uh, next slide, uh, new deals in um, the Caribbean mostly, 
uh, Bahamas, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Jamaica with the, the two on top, Bahamas and Grenada. Uh, the most advanced at this point and, and with the hope of being able to close those maybe later this year uh, or early next year. Um, and a number of additional countries in the Caribbean. Not surprisingly, given my 18-year career in the, working in the Caribbean, I have uh, long-term relationships with these countries. Um, we also have St. Lucia, St. Vincent, the Grenadines, Puerto Rico, Dominica, um, and the Dominican Republic have all expressed interest as well. Um, so, but I can only do about two of these a year, but uh, definitely can, we'll stay busy in the Caribbean for the next uh, few years for sure. Uh, next slide, so what does it take to pull one of these uh, deals off? Um, you need a, a, a willing buyer, so that's the debtor country, and, and we want and need the conservation policy commitments up front via cabinet endorsement. Uh, a willing seller, that's the creditor, uh, and then the financing in place, grant or loan capital. And then to close, the trust in place and, and the legal, legal agreements finalized. We've been fortunate in having um, uh, great pro bono uh, assistance, and so they helped with uh, writing the legislation, for example. In, in the Caribbean, most of those trusts are created through the, the Companies Act at the national level. It's a little easier to do than passing legislation. They helped with that, and they also helped with the legal agreements. Um, and so, you know, we created those from scratch in this first deal. It'll go a lot faster in the next deals um, with the legal agreements. Um, this is my last slide. Um, so some of the things learned, not surprisingly, patience. Uh, you know, four years to close that Seychelles deal. Uh, we're hoping to go a little faster. If the Bahamas deal might be about a year, um, year and a half, the Grenada deal a couple years. So, um, you know, now having proof of concept, I think we can go faster. We have a, a, a also raised a bunch of uh, grant money uh, with support from the German government just, uh, for um, doing these deals in the Caribbean, um, tune of about $26 million. So, uh, that was one, as I mentioned, for the Seychelles, something that slowed us down. Scale matters. You know, obviously, uh, if you're going to do a deal like this and, and the amount of time and effort it takes, you want it to make an impact at multiple levels um, in, in uh, restructuring debt, uh, creating enough cash flow, etc. Uh, Ministry of Finance is key, is key for obvious reasons, but that, that's been uh, interesting for us as a conservation organization. You know, historically, our, our primary counterpart was Ministry of Environment. Um, and, and I can tell you in most countries, you know, the, uh, in the, the hierarchy of, of, of the ministries, there's a big difference. Ministry of Finance is usually on top and Ministry of Environment at the bottom. So it's been, uh, you know, re refreshing to, to work at that level. Uh, and in the Seychelles, my, my co-leads were the two ministers, Minister of Finance and Minister of Environment, and they worked very well together. And similarly, in the other countries, I have co-leads from, from both ministries. Uh, High-level commitments helpful, as I mentioned early on. Uh, when we had the Vice President of the Seychelles uh, make a statement that they would uh, put 30% of their EEZ in marine protected areas and half no take uh, in a public forum, that, you know, obviously um, demonstrates the, the, the commitment by the government and, and opens a lot of doors in, in the country for making this happen. And, and then, of course, the concepts have been well received by the countries, donors, uh, investors. As I've mentioned, uh, all the countries that are uh, showing interest in the Caribbean, um, uh, and elsewhere, um, and the fact that we've lined up, um, you know, a significant amount of, of donations from the German government to, to finance these deals in the Caribbean. And then finally, the, the, the final point is just that, you know, obviously you need broad stakeholder consensus at multiple levels, um, you know, to do a, a marine spatial plan properly, and then on the board as well. You know, we want these to, to be representative and, and all the stakeholders to feel that um, they participated in the process. You know, obviously when these things are done in a back room and presented, they don't go over well, but when everyone participates and, and sees the give and take that happens, uh, you get the buy-in. Um, and fun, last slide is just uh, my contact details. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me, thank you very much, and, uh, and also uh, where you might find a little bit more about uh, Nature Best and what we do. So okay. I know that was a ton of information, and I'm happy <laughs> to take some questions now. <laughs> Rob, well, that was awesome. I, this is something that I, that I think is fascinating, and it's just great to get uh, the skinny on this. Um, I did screw up one slide. I have to admit, I didn't make the change in time. So uh, if anybody wants me to go back to that slide, I can. It was, uh, yeah. uh, I can go back. But I, otherwise, I, I, I think I was right on target. Um, yeah, okay. I, think, I think I was uh, missing saying uh, move forward. I was <laughs> moving it forward on my computer and forgetting to say anything. My apologies. 
No, no problem. I, I should have caught it. Um, anyway, so that went well. I just, just to remind everyone how to ask questions, again, you can uh, type the questions into the question panel of the user interface or raise your virtual hand, um, and I can unmute you. Um, Craig, I would say I see your hand raised. If you want me to call on you, just uh, send me a note uh, through the question panel that you um, really do want to be called on. Okay. Um, okay, we have some good questions already. All right. Um, is the Paris Club likely to be a willing creditor for future deals, or are all deals done with country members of the Paris Club, such as Germany? Yeah, so good question. You know, so that was a bit unique. Um, you know, so if you um, the ones that I'm working on um, in the Caribbean, for example, um, we will not be going through the Paris Club. Uh, you know, the Bahamas, it's commercial debt. It's actually um, uh, debt that's held by the um, Bahamas Power and Light, uh, and so we're going to work through them. Of course, that's a, a state-owned enterprise. Uh, and then in Grenada, it's uh, bilateral debt and some commercial debt that's um, some bonds that they have floated that trade on the market. You can buy. It's not super liquid, but uh, you can buy them. So most of these other deals, it'll be one-on-one -on -one negotiations with uh, single creditors. There is, you know, always the possibility of, of uh, you know, um, going back to the Paris Club if, if that's the appropriate way and there's multiple um, creditors. But um, none of the ones I'm working on right now would have us going back to the Paris Club. Although the Paris Club did tell us they really loved the deal uh, and would like to do more things like this. Okay. All right. Uh, that's pretty exciting. Okay, um, there are two questions about Belize. Um, uh, just one, could you um, outline your experiences there, and then a another, um, oh, well, lots of questions coming in. Okay, um, let me go find the one I was reading. Um, and could you uh, explain a bit about your experience in Belize and relate that with the challenges you are finding in other countries? Yeah, so, um, yeah, Belize, uh, I spent... Uh, five years uh, putting together a deal there. Um, it was a little, um, you know, I was brought into it after the fact um, and we did not get the conservation commitments up front. So it was a lesson learned for us. Uh, so we actually had uh, $40 million in hand between grant money and loan capital from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we had identified um, they have a super bond commercial debt that was trading around 60 cents on the dollar. We uh, it was over, I think the total, it's over 500 million out there. We were going to, uh, with that uh, 40 million, we'd be able to buy uh, a significant portion uh, and um, restructure it. And it would have created a really nice cash flow, uh, something like, I think it was like 65, 75 million dollars over a little less than 20 years and capitalize an endowment of, of close to the same size. Uh, but um, we just, unfortunately, you know, we got all that together and then, uh, was, you know, we were simultaneously trying to get the, the government commitment, but we just never got the, the commitment. And, uh, you know, without that, our board really wanted, you know, not surprisingly, the government buy-in. Um, and there was, you know, there were some uh, complicating issues in, in Belize. Um, those of you who are familiar, you know, that was around the time Oceana had done the uh, referendum on whether or not they should drill for oil on the uh, Barrier Reef. Uh, um, and the majority of the population voted no. Um, and so there was a little anti, on the government side, anti-NGO um, sentiment and, and the fact that these funds would be available to both uh, government and NGO sector. Um, so it was a little unfortunate, but as I said, you know, the lesson learned for us was that, you know, we do not uh, get too far advanced in putting the deal together uh, until we get the, uh, the the cabinet endorsement to um, to do the deal. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, Elena, mm -hmm. I see your hand is raised. Can you shoot me a, a, a message, Elena, just saying that you do really want to ask a question, and I'll unmute you. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Do you think this can be used as a funding mechanism for the development and operations of IUU? Um, it's a illegal and underreported and what was the um, fishing. All right, so IUU detection, enforcement, prevention in countries that are especially impacted. I've got the other IUU. It's illegal, underreported, and unreported fishing. Someone help me out. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the finance guy, so I'm, I, <laughs> yes. I'm not remembering that either. Um, you know, that's the, the beauty of these deals. You can, uh, you know, use them to finance, um, you know, what are what the priorities are. 
you know, we are uh, to some degree keeping, um, you know, the, what we focus on financing uh, across the country, all these countries, you know, in line with uh, what they put forward around uh, the blue economy out of Rio. Uh, you know, obviously by uh, keeping, it's easier to tell the story if, if, it's, if it's more or less similar. Not to say that, you know, if that weren't uh, specifically uh, in one of the co uh, countries we were working on, an issue they wanted to finance out of that, that we couldn't finance it. You know, obviously we want to be responsive to uh, the governments we're working with. Okay, thanks, Rob. And uh, some folks did help me out. It's illegal, underreported, and unregulated fishing. Uh, okay. There we go. All right. Um, let's see. Um, can this scheme be uh, work within a regional context? For example, um, is if if there is a regional uh, marine spatial pr uh, planning process, uh, could the scheme for one specific country, um, part of the regional project, contribute towards the regional work? Um, yeah, you know, um, you know, anything's possible, you know, uh, although, you know, what you're going to run into is, is the, the, you know, the country is, um, you know, it's their debt, you restructure it and they're paying it in. Most likely, I would say the country is going to want to see that investment, um, uh, you know, in their own EEZ and, and coastal waters. Uh, you know, not to say that they might not be willing to, you know, carve off a small portion and, you know, I, I obviously the more they would want to see other countries do similar things and not be putting money into a regional pot by themselves, but um, not to say something like that couldn't be explored. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. When negotiating this deal, what attracted the Paris Club to enter into this agreement? Was it their ability to give back to the environment or uh, obligation to finance climate adaptation? or something else? Yeah, actually, it was a purely financial uh, motive. Uh, not to say that they weren't happy for, uh, you know, the one thing, they spent a lot of time, uh, actually like five hours writing the, um, the press release. Usually the press releases come out about 30 minutes after uh, they, they come to a, a conclusion of a deal. But they wanted to, you know, highlight the environmental aspects of it. But, uh, you know, that 93 cents on the dollar was net present value, you know. So those countries were paid, uh, you know, what any, what the, the value of that cash flow was uh, in today's dollars. Um, although, you know, the French government did, uh, to, to make the, bring the deal down a little bit, the French government did use 300,000 euros of their own money to offset uh, and make the discount a little sweeter. So you could say that, you know, the French government was coming into it from the, the, the climate adaptation and, and, and biodiversity conservation side. Uh, but the rest of them were, um, it was, you know, a financial, purely financial motive. And, and that would be the same for, you know, like these deals we were doing with uh, buying comm back commercial debt. Um, and even I think most of the bilateral debt we're, we're looking at in other deals, we'd be net present value. Not to say you would you know, potentially ask a country to consider, you know, you'd, you'd figure out what net present value is, and, and this would be a bilateral donor only that would most likely consider this and, and maybe ask them to knock another 5 or 10% off uh, as a discount um, just to uh, create more cash flow for conservation and, and adaptation, for example. But um, at the end of the day, it's really just a financial transaction. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, how does Puerto Rico's status as a commonwealth of the U.S. affect its ability to go through the debt swap process? Uh, what would be needed to make this possible? Um, you know, so those of you who are uh, following Puerto Rico, you probably know they've got over $70 billion of debt. They can't make payments back. They have a, a fiscal control board, um, and they're in talking to creditors, and, and this is going to be a case where somewhere between, I guess, 20 to 40 percent of the principal has to be written off, um, you know. Uh, but there, you know, the, the, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the different, there can be different creditors who would be, you know, and a lot of this debt sells at like 30 cents on the dollar. Uh, and so, it, you know, it would be just a matter of, um, you know, for one thing, we're trying to make sure we understand um, how this restructuring is going to happen. You know, it could happen where all the creditors are asked to come together and all agree to the same haircut, but I'm beginning to, to you know, learn that they're, um, you know, with the fiscal control board that they can, uh, and I may have the name of that entity not exactly right, but they, the, the oversight of, of this debt restructuring. I think voluntary restructurings can be, um, you know, agreed to, meaning that if, uh, you know, we 
find some creditors willing to sell to us at 30 cents on the dollar and we want to buy that debt and restructure it and, and write off a portion for the government, you know, and um, and then but you know, the way to think about it is, is let's say we um, you want to buy a hundred million dollars of debt, and you can buy it for thirty cents on the dollar. That means you have to bring thirty million to the table, and then you say to uh, the the government, um, you know, we'll write off thirty percent of that, or or even forty percent, and so you now owe us um, you know the remaining. Uh, so that's forty million. You owe us sixty million dollars. And if we do that with 30 million in loan money, you pay back the loan with 30 million, and it leaves you 30 million for conservation. Um, you know, so that's the sort of uh, the restructuring that's going on, um, and so it's just you know jumping into that and, and participating in that, and we would just be like any other creditor if we bought that debt and, and did that restructuring. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rob. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the blue bonds that have been issued? Um, and I, she she added, I think, to the through the revolving fund. Yeah. So um, yeah, and I can actually we we in the Nation Conservancy are also looking to uh, potentially issue some blue bonds for uh, raising the loan capital for uh, the deals we're working on in the Caribbean. Um, so we're in the we're in the process of, uh, of of figuring out exactly how we're going to do that. Um, just got a grant uh, to help us with that, and again, working with our pro bono attorneys. Um, uh, but the Seychelles are uh, going to beat us, I think, to the uh, being the one of the first to ever issue a blue bond. And they are um, the government will issue this the 15 million in notes. They're getting some support with the, from the World Bank, as I mentioned, and the Jeff in issuing these. The support that they're providing is helping to reduce bring the interest rate down on, uh, uh, for the government. Um, uh, and uh, and so the government issues these. I'm not exactly sure of the length of maturity. Um, I'm guessing it's probably around 10 years. Um, uh, and I can't remember what the interest rate on their blue bond is. Um, but the idea being is that my understanding is, is that um, obviously if the government borrows money, they have to pay back. Um, and the source of repayment would be uh, that the government is going to end the fuel subsidy on the semi-industrial fleet. Uh, in uh, the Seychelles, and, and the savings from that will allow them to make the payments back on those bonds. Um, and you know, obviously, it's a good time to, to do something like reducing fuel subsidies. Fuel prices are down. Uh, but the other thing that they, the analysis has shown that is that um, it will also shrink the size of the fleet by, I think, a third. Um, you know, so a lot of the people who are, are fishing because they're getting fuel for all but free. And when they now have to pay for fuel, they will, some of those, uh, um, those semi-industrial ships will stop fishing. Uh, idea being then if uh, the remaining sh uh, fishermen uh, and ships will then uh, be able to potentially catch more, then that will allow them to pay for the fuel. So uh, hopefully it's a win-win all around. The government, you know, through create, you know, ending the fuel subsidy can repay the loans. Uh, Three million is available for uh, implementing a fisheries management plan. And, and uh, funding the new marine protected areas, and then as well a revolving fund. Uh, what that might fund would be, for example, if fishermen want to uh, upgrade gear, buy ice machines to better store fish, put in uh, solar panels to get off the grid. Electricity is very expensive. Um, uh, maybe retraining even for fishermen to move into other things around the tourism sector, for example, dive operators or for boat operators and things like that. So that's the idea of the, of the revolving fund is to you know help um, you know diversify the economy and and and, uh, and, and and around things like that. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. And um, another question: Is there any potential for this to be used within more developed countries? How would you structure that, or is it really limited to SIDS? Um, no, it's not limited to SIDS. Um, you know, we are. Uh, you know, you know. I think that this could be done in um, you know larger island states, uh, continental countries, even you know fully uh, you know a, a landlocked country. I mean, you know, that's the beauty of these deals; they can be you know uh, tailored to specific needs. Um, you know, we are looking at, for example, uh, you know, uh, in the Indian Ocean, maybe uh, there's interest from, from Mauritius. Uh, I have yet to speak with them, but. Uh, um, uh, I've heard that there's interest. Uh, the, the the debt advisors, the Seychelles, are often the debt advisors uh, to these are external advisors to the Mauritius, and they floated the idea there. And there seems to be some interest. 
uh, we as the Nature Conservancy have, are working with the World Bank on marine spatial planning in Mauritius. They're part of the West Indian Ocean Challenge, so it'd be you know it makes sense for us to focus there. But then uh, you have Kenya, Tanzania, also part of the West Indian Ocean Challenge. Uh, this might be a way to you know try to do something uh, you know similar uh, for supporting uh, marine protected areas in those coastal areas. Um, you know, the one thing though, I, I you know I do see by working with small island states. Uh, you know, when you do some of these deals, uh, you know, you can, the, given that the economies are on the small side, a billion or less, and you do a deal that's, um, you know, 50 or $80 million, you're talking about, you know, 5 or 8% of GDP. You know, so it is, it makes a big bang for the buck. You start getting into bigger countries and you do a deal that well, sounds big at 50 or 80 million, it's a, a drop in the bucket. So it's sometimes I think a little harder to get the attention of those countries. Um, to be interested, but not to say that you know it's um, it, like I said, it could be this could be replicated anywhere. And um, you do, you know, if you remember the enabling factors, though, you do uh, what also makes it work. You know, beyond those enabling factors, you know, the country willing to do it, the creditor willing to sell, and being able to raise the capital is the discount. You know, being able to buy at a discount. So if you have a country that you know has uh, their debt doesn't trade at a discount, uh, it really it's difficult. It's not all but impossible to really make the numbers work. Um, there's also uh, examples of uh, this country in the Caribbean that refinanced 97% of their debt with the World Bank at very concessionary rates, and the, you know all the, mul the multilaterals do not do sell a discount. And again, so that that takes that country out as a, a place where we could do something like that. So um, you know, so there are a lot of different factors you have to look at. Um, you know, not every country will you know all of those pieces fall into place to allow something like this to happen. Um, it's just a matter of you know digging in to, and, uh, and and looking at the different enabling conditions and seeing what's there or not there. Okay, uh, thanks, Rob. Now I'm going to sort of paraphrase one of the questions. Uh, what sort of continued involvement do um, creditors or, or TNC have uh, in the work that goes on. Like, what if the country decided they didn't want to use the funds for conservation work? Like, what, what, what happens? Yeah, what sort of oversight? I don't know. Don't know that that's the best word, but uh, is there of the work to make sure it's going for the intended purpose? Yeah, good question. So, uh, in all of these cases, TNC has a seat on the board. Uh, of these entities, um, and we uh, get a seat as a founding member. And usually, the government has at least one or has one founding member seat. So the minimum of two founding members, and in some cases, we'll we'll have a third founding member, a local conservation NGO, for example. And uh, the founding members are important uh, uh, from both the government side and from TNC side in that they are given um, extra uh, sort of. Uh, I guess it's. Um, Kind of analogous to a veto right, basically around major decisions, uh, around the, the focus of the the, the trust, uh, where the money is spent, uh, the investment policy for the endowment, etc. All three founding members, or two, or however many they are, have to agree. So you want consensus, um, and you can think of it from the government side. You know, there are only four of nine seats. They, you know, they, they have a fear that maybe they would be ganged up by civil society. And by having that um, veto, uh, that requirement for consensus, they know that they, you know, ha you know, can that won't happen. And similarly for TNC, uh, we as well, you know, it's always possible in a country that um, government might capture some of the civil society seats unbeknownst, and all of a sudden we find, you know, things being voted on that, you know, not that as we expected. But by having that founding member uh, seat, it allows us to ensure that the original vision uh, stays in place. You know, and obviously if we're lending $15 million of our own funds to the deal for 10 years, you know, we want to have that oversight. And then beyond that, if you have donors, uh, you know, granting $5 million to the deal and, and you're promising certain things, you want to uh, be able to uh, demonstrate that you are actually delivering on those. Um, and, you know, and so for example, in the Seychelles deal, there are, there's the timeline and the expectation for uh, you know, uh, government to hit those timelines. There are some grace periods, but if they miss them, or if a future government decides they don't want to do them, there are in the Seychelles deal. There's uh, financial penalties, you know, acceleration of the loan, uh, and things like that. So, you know, we try to, you know, uh, ensure that you know as much as possible that, that the oversight is there. 
Um, and on the MSP, for example, we're going to, uh, once it's finalized and approved, we'll, uh, we have funding to do a, a cost-benefit analysis and get a baseline on that. And, you know, over time we can measure. Um, you know, a lot of these things are quite measurable. You know, do you get the marine protected areas in place? And then you start to get a baseline on, uh, you know, management effectiveness. And is there a management plan? Is there funding? Is there staff, et cetera? So, you know, we intend to do monitoring the whole way along. Um, you know, you know, number of uh, you know, man, you know, mangrove and coral projects and, and you know, square footage or square meters, you know, concluded, uh, uh, you know, things like that. So we definitely intend to, you know, along the way, um, you know, measure the impact of the deal and, and demonstrate that we are, you know, achieving what we aim to do. Okay, thank you, Rob. Elena, are you there? Okay. Elena. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to a different question. Um, in the SACAT trust, were there other uh, mechanisms for continued finance implemented in addition to the endowment? You mentioned diversification and sustainable tourism. Are funds uh, from these endeavors flowing back to the trust or only one way? Um, yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned, there's going to be the $12 million revolving fund that would focus on those areas, you know, through the Blue Bond Fund. So we probably won't uh, need to use any of uh, the resources. Uh, but we did think of that as potentially a mix of grant um, and uh, loan uh, funding. Um, you know, so if it were a revolving, you know, if we did set up our own revolving loan fund, you know, separate, uh, you know, or if there wasn't the one being set up by the government, uh, you know, we could look to set up a small revol revolving loan fund, um, and uh, you know, those would be if it was a loan, you know, from uh, SACAT to to some small business, uh, we would expect to be repaid, and you know, and we would uh, ex you know have a small interest rate on it, but n nothing uh, outrageous. Um, so yeah, those are definitely you know things we have thought about. But I think it's going to be you know country by country and, and case by case. You know, we wanted you know you, you saw those the things that we're funding and we kept them purposely at you know sort of large bullet points. We want the boards you know the people closest to the ground to really decide on priorities and and to refine you know the details of what gets funded because they obviously are going to know best. Okay, and that's a good segue into um, my second to last question that I have right now. Um, is this option available for innovative conservation measures? Um, not familiar uh, with innovation, in, innovative conservation measures, so I'm sorry I can't answer that. If, if you can give me some more details, I could maybe answer the question. Okay. Uh, well, I'll see if they send. Um, I was assuming that it would, it might be untested technologies or or such. Uh, that it's sort of lowercase innovative conservation measures. Um, so I'll, I'll let if, if they want to follow up, I'll let them send more info. Sure. Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, I was chatting okay. to myself. Um, no, I went to get just to grab another question, which had come into my email, but. Uh, um, okay, so the there was a follow-up. So the, the original question is: this option available for innovative conservation measures? And um, so, and they just thought of. Uh, so far, we have talked about tested measures such as MPAs and tourism. Um, and Rajiv, if maybe if you could uh, specify some examples of what you're thinking when you say innovative conservation measures. Was that to me or? No, that's a Rajiv uh, who was okay. asking about this. Just, okay. just making sure. Okay, I'll give it one more minute, and that's our last question. I went to go. I went to go grab a question that had come into my email, but I think we've we've already covered the blue bonds. So, okay. Oh, okay. An, an example of innovative conservation measure would be um, MSC certification, and for. Um, I always try and define the acronym, oh, so that's Marine Stewardship right. Council. Yeah, no, I think that would make, you know, that would be something that would would fit in under that uh, sustainable fisheries uh, sort of uh, a concept uh, really well. So, yes, that's a great example. 
Okay. Uh, well, that this was great. This was great Q and A. It was great presentation, Rob. And this is, this is such exciting work. And so I really uh, send you guys all the best. And we're very grateful you're you're undertaking this. Um, so Rob's contact has been up for a while. If you wanted to get in touch with him, if anybody has follow up. And um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. We've had a number of requests for the recording, too, um, from people who weren't able to attend. Um, so the recording will be posted within about 24 hours on openchannels.org. And if anybody needs a link to that, you can just email me if you wanted to send the recording to anyone else. OK, but thank you, Rob. This was great. And, and thank you to everyone who, was intended and, who attended. And uh, uh, good luck to everyone with their, their conservation and management work. Great. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.